Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to LAMIF Plus Plus seminar. Today, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor David Prendergast uh, from far away, La Molecular Foundry in the Berkeley Lab, so on the west coast of, of the US. That's why we have eight hours of difference between us, but we have also yeah, many participants from different time zones. So David will talk about unsupervised learning of representative local atomic arrangements in molecular dynamic data. Over to you, David, please. Okay, thank you very much, Fitili, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, just to let people know, uh, if, you know if you're new to science or if you're just starting your career, sometimes, how, how does this happen? How does somebody get an invitation to speak somewhere? And you know, sometimes it's just driven by curiosity, right? Uh, Vitaly just emailed me to ask me about some work we had recently published. Uh, I responded, I was glad to hear of his interest. And that led to this invitation to learn more. And that's very common in science. So if, if you feel your own curiosity driven by something you see in the literature, feel free to reach out to those authors and communicate with them. It's a big part of what we do as scientists. And who knows what will happen, right? That's, that's one of the exciting parts of being a scientist. So uh, before we began, Fidley and I were discussing this building here. This is where I work. So we're located um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. San Francisco is out here in the distance. Uh, you cannot see the famous bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. It's kind of behind the building. And we are across this very large bay here, San Francisco Bay, in the city of Berkeley. And the University of California, Berkeley, is right underneath this building as well. Okay. So... What are we going to talk about? So um, I, I work at a, a national laboratory, so a place that is focused on energy related problems. And I'm particularly interested in concepts that evolve around how to understand energy conversion and storage. And that could be anything from, you know, if you look around you, okay, in your, your cell phone, right? Um, how the energy is stored in the battery in that cell phone, um, how, what are the details at the molecular scale or the atomic scale to define how that energy storage works, uh, how you can make those things more efficient and more reliable and safe. Um, you could go beyond that if you want to capture energy from the sun. So solar harvesting is another approach. In that case, you're creating excited states from absorbing photons and then separating those excited states into charges that you can use to drive electrical um, devices. Um, we've also worked on capture of gases, so CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, the generation of gases we might need, or their storage, like hydrogen. You'll hear a lot of talk uh, in the media these days about uh, people trying to switch their economies more towards hydrogen, away from fossil fuels, because if you burn hydrogen, you just make uh, water vapor. Um, and, you know, there's potential ways that even fossil fuel companies can clean their operations by switching towards generation of hydrogen and avoiding the release of carbon dioxide. And then there's the clean way of making hydrogen, electrolysis, whereby you kind of combine a battery and this hydrogen storage concept together and use electricity to generate the gases that you need. So what's common to all of these different formats here is that to make the necessary devices to do this, you need to create interfaces. You need to connect two materials together. And it's that difference between the two materials or even a gradient within a material that creates the functionality. So there's a very famous quote from a Nobel Prize winner, Herbert Kramer, who said that the interface is the device, right? When you think about what a device is, it's the interface between things that defines its functionality. And so we're trying to understand those interfaces. Now, if I picked one example, so let's say an electrochemical interface that you might see in a battery. In this case, you have some electrode, which is electronically conducting. You can charge this uh, positively or negatively, and it draws ions out of a solution nearby called the electrolyte. And it's this collection of charge on one side or the other of the battery. This is just half a battery shown here. That defines the functionality of this charge storing device. And the way I like to think about this problem is at a very dense molecular scale. And this talk is kind of about what do you do with all of that data? So uh, when you run so-called molecular dynamics, which is like a movie that follows all the molecules and what they're doing in time, um, 
you have a lot of data. It's almost like doing an experiment in the sense that you generate a lot of data and now you have to think about what do I extract from this data? How do I make sense of it? Or as I've said here, what stories might be hidden in this data? And there are particular questions I might be interested in, but um, we have to be careful in the sense that every question you ask of the data may inadvertently introduce some bias in how you do the analysis and you have to be careful about that. But uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But specifically, I might be worried or interested in how are these ions in the solution kind of surrounded by the solvent molecules? Um, how do they move as easily or slowly through that system? What happens when they reach the interface? They have to somehow shed this surrounding of molecules and be released to touch the surface in order to transfer charge. How does that work? And are there bottlenecks or roadblocks that prevent that from working well in certain contexts? So uh, I know that uh, Professor Curling has done some work on looking at uh, crystal structures. If you're familiar with that work, just think of molecular dynamics as lots and lots and lots of structures, right? One after the other, like the frames of a movie. And it's a similar problem. You have to classify them or understand them in some way. So there's not a, a huge difference there from a data point of view. Okay, so just some quick goals to focus a talk. So the general problem is that we're trying to get information content from high dimensional data. And that's a, a general problem that exists for many scientists. Our goal would be to try to develop a minimal model to describe our data. That's typically what physicists try to do. Physicists are cheap in the sense that they want to do the least amount of work and get the greatest possible outcome. Uh, so simple models are the most fascinating and the most exciting because they can describe a lot of things very easily. And you kind of want to strike this balance between the minimal amount of complexity in your model and then the maximum amount of return in terms of understanding your data. From a statistics point of view, you can think of that as, you know, you want to just fit the data, not overfit the data, not underfit the data, just fit the data, right? And the challenge here is to avoid bias in developing this model, right? Ideally, I don't want to make assumptions about the data. I want the data to teach me about its content, okay? Um, and what we're going to develop within this approach is we're going to use clustering. So that's a technique that some of you may be familiar with in data science, which allows you to extract similar groups from data, and then some amount of dimensionality reduction that allows that process to be more efficient. Okay, so we'll, we'll define those terms as we go. So here's what that might look like in my chosen application. So um, this is one frame of a reasonable size molecular dynamic simulation of an interface between an electrode, that's these two kind of dark gray layers over here, and an electrolyte, which has some dissolved ions within it. And this is how practitioners would typically learn about this system based on, you know, the training they would get in their PhD and postdocs and the work they would do in their research as professors, right? You might take out individual snapshots and examine them, look at them by eye and try to gain some insight, say, okay, in this case, I have a calcium ion and it's got some borohydride anions around it in purple and the rest is the solvent. Okay, sometimes, yeah, there seems to be always two of those, sometimes straight, sometimes bent. And then you start to think about, hmm, maybe I could design some tests, geometric tests, mathematical tests to analyze the data to see if my uh, limited view, because this is only one little picture taken from thousands and thousands of these images, um, am I learning something, is it teaching me something about general behavior in the system? So that's kind of, you could think of this as anecdotal evidence, looking at individual snapshots and trying to learn from using your brain and your eyes to see differences. David, Other things, oh, go ahead, yeah. Sorry, could, could I ask a question here? Yeah, sure, anytime. Uh, indeed. So in these simulations, um, I ask about approximate numbers of atoms, and and also since we see many solvent molecules, which are probably less important, uh, how many actually important atoms uh, do you usually simulate? Very good question. So the typical size here is maybe in the thousands of atoms, but it doesn't, I wouldn't say that's a limiting factor. You could do a smaller simulation or a bigger simulation. 
Um, <clears throat> and in this case, there are maybe in this box two to four to maybe 10 discrete objects that we really care about. As you said, the solvent may not be that important. It might be the things floating within it and uh, dissolved within it that we care about. So that would say that for every snapshot of this movie, there's maybe on the order of five to 10 things we care about. But then there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of those snapshots. Mm -hmm. So the, the scale starts to grow really in the length of time that you simulate for and how much value you think is in that data versus the typical size of the box. But you, you can scale those parameters any way you, you like. Um, and what I'm describing here is not that much limited by the size of the data, but you're right in, in terms of, let's say, the study of crystals, this might be a much smaller system. Although if you move to protein crystallography, that might be about the same size or even bigger. So yeah, in, in the kind of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of data frames, that would be a, a good metric. Okay, so, thank you, thank you, Dave. Speaking of that, you know, one way to kind of reduce the amount of data that you have to work with is to use statistics. And what's shown in the bottom left here are distribution functions. So this is basically um, a radial distribution function showing for a given atom, uh, calcium in this case, how often is there an oxygen or a boron in the solution nearby and what do these curves look like? And you can see a sharp peak at short distance means almost like a bond. They like to be together. Um, and so you can use statistics like that to inform your intuition about what's happening. You can even count or by integrating these peaks and say, okay, at a certain radius, there should be on average this amount of atoms. But again, you throw away a lot of information in this case because it's radially averaged and it's assuming certain things um, which we'll get to in a second, but the concept of an average behavior is, is what emerges from these pictures. Additionally, you can run your molecular dynamic simulation in a kind of controlled or contrived way by fixing some degree of freedom that you use as a controlled parameter. So that's typically called biased molecular dynamics or steered molecular dynamics. And in this graph here, what we're controlling is the position of one of these green calciums as a function of its distance from this interface. And if you, if you do that in a careful way and examine the dynamics that results, you can actually extract what would be called a free energy, which is um, inclusion of the cost of placing the atom at that position. And it includes some degree of the entropy as well, not just energy, but the amount of uh, disorder that's present in the system. And that's really important for thermodynamic quantities because actually the stability of many materials is like a battle between order that's induced by enthalpy or energy, attraction of things, and disorder, which is naturally increasing in all thermodynamic systems. And so they kind of balance one another sometimes. And so that's why, you know, milk dissolves into tea and you can't do the reverse. You can't get the milk back out of the tea because the system has lowered its free energy by increasing entropy. Okay. The, the, so, could, yes. could ask one more basic question? Uh, Please. Since I see the keyword coordination number on your slide. So I, I guess lots of basic chemistry, but remember I'm a mathematician. Okay. <laughs> training. Uh, so how exactly this coordination number is defined, for example, in your case? Ah, uh, okay. So there are different ways to estimate coordination numbers. So in this case, we're counting basically uh, how many solvent molecules are around a calcium ion. And up, to, uh, up to a threshold. Up to a threshold, exactly. And there's two kind of standard ways to do that. One is actual statistical counting, let's say, with a radial cutoff. Mm -hmm. And another way is with a smooth continuous function that you can evaluate that essentially gives you the same quantity, but it's differentiable um, and doesn't have a hard cutoff. It has a smooth cutoff. So those functions typically look like one minus the actual distance divided by some effective distance to the power of some large number divided by a similar expression, one minus R over R zero to a power of even larger number. And typically the two exponents would be, I don't know, six or 12 or 
even higher, 12 and 18. Um, and that, when you evaluate a function that looks like that, it's basically like a step, like um, a smooth version of a step function. And so it accumulates statistics on those objects that are near up to a distance close to that effective radius, R0. Mm -hmm. So here on the vertical axis, do we see this threshold uh, in angstroms? Uh, is it so, a different distance? Let's see. So graphite distance. No, that's a different distance. So in this case, and sorry, I, I'm deliberately not talking about too many details here because I'm just kind of sure. skimming over this. But in this case, this is the distance that calcium might be from this interface. And what I'm trying to learn is as we approach the interface, um, is there something changing about the surroundings of the calcium? So let's say far from the interface, in this case, it looks like it would like to have either three or four solvent molecules around it. There's two deep minima there, these two channels. But then as you approach the interface, these kind of, oops, they slip slightly to the left. And that implies you're lowering the coordination number as you get to the interface, which might make sense because there's less room, you're constricting things. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would interpret this free energy diagram. Okay. Thank yeah. You. All right. Good question. So it, that actually leads naturally into this slide. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that often we fall into a trap of asking the question, like, what is the typical environment, definite article, the meaning we are maybe assuming there's only one. And that's a dangerous trap to fall into because um, we don't have any proof that there's only one. Maybe there are multiple environments that coexist, or maybe there are multiple possibilities um, that kind of compete with one another to be the resultant state that you observe. And so this is a common problem in across physical sciences like coexistence of phases in materials. You're not always guaranteed that one phase is the dominant one at a given state or a given set of uh, conditions. And in statistical modeling as well, you'll see most of the books from which you learn things like data science or machine learning, oftentimes buried within those concepts is an intrinsic assumption that there is a one mean, one average behavior and that that one mean is meaningful, which is not always true, okay? And I picked a simple example here. In this case, these are cations in green. In this case, it's magnesium surrounded by solvent molecules. And it turns out that the free energy of this system has two minima, one with six-fold coordination and one with five-fold coordination. Now, what does that look like? If you do the simulation, it turns out that you can start a very long molecular dynamics trajectory in either of these initial states, five-fold or six-fold coordination, so the, the left or the right here, and they'll stay that way. They won't exchange molecules with the environment. Those bonds are pretty strong because this ion here has a charge of plus two, so it's very strong electrostatic interaction, holds those objects together. Or another way to think about that is that the free energy minimum is deep, and you don't see that these objects exchange, but Looking at this diagram on the top right, it looks like they have very similar free energies, which would mean that they're probably they should be there in a kind of a 50-50 mix and not only one or the other. And so in this case, we have to be very careful. Um, molecular dynamics on its own, without any constraints, might not be enough to exhibit all the observable behavior we should expect to see. And that's why we sometimes use these constraints like coordination number or distance to more fully explore the phase space that we're sampling. And then once we do that, we have to be open to the existence of multiple states, multiple local minima, or if you think about it from a statistical point of view, multiple modes in our distribution. So not just a single normal distribution, but a multimodal, a collection of normal distributions, if you want to think of it that way. Okay. So, all right, so to do this problem, right, we want to identify species of interest in this electrolyte. And what we'll do is we'll extract local atomic clusters from the data, as Vitaly mentioned, those are the, the cations and their local environments, and then try to determine the population of, from chemistry, what you would call isomers, meaning they have the same chemical formula, but a different structure. So, Yes, we can do the first thing quite easily with 
standard statistics like these radial distribution functions, we can learn what is the dominant uh, local environment around a given species and then define an effective cutoff radius, maybe in this case for angstroms to say, okay, anything that happens beyond that is a little bit more disordered or has less well-defined uh, peak in its distribution function. Um, we can then extract all these local atomic clusters and now they're tumbling around in a fluid, so they'll have random orientations and random positions in space, but this is what they might look like in a cartoon. And then the question is, okay, what do we have here? Uh, how do we classify these different objects and do that efficiently? And that's where it gets a bit hard. So by eye, and with a little bit of training, you might say, okay, maybe there are some key things I see here, always too pink chlorohydrides and these reds are the solvent molecules there's generally always two pinks sometimes they're in a straight line sometimes bent okay and maybe you could come up with some tests but when this gets bigger and more complicated that gets more challenging and so this is typically what the problem looks like right you have and this is still small this is uh, a very small subset of all the data we had, but we just put this up as a cartoon to show you, you know, what you're presented with by eye, right? Thousands of these little images that you would have to sort. And so as a human, that's not a, an enjoyable task or even maybe a possible task in the time you might have available. So we have to organize this somehow and to try to do it in an automatic way and without bias. Okay, so one way to try to think about this is how would we optimally align these objects so by eye you could see quickly if they are similar or not and there's a an intuitive concept here about you know whether something is invariant or not or similar um, in terms of its structure and obviously you know if I have an apple in my hand here and an apple in my hand over here it's still an apple so translation is not something that changes property so we can remove that right if I turn the apple upside down it's still an apple so rotation not a big issue. And then inversion, some objects have inversion symmetry. Maybe we want to include that as well to prevent distinction between an apple and its mirror image. Now there's something else that's a bit more challenging that's permutation. Meaning if I described all the little pieces of the apple in a certain order, but then I came back tomorrow and I did that in a different way, it wouldn't be a different apple. Like if I started from the top and worked my way down through the apple and little little volume pieces one at a time and then tomorrow I started from the bottom and worked my way up that doesn't make it a different object and so sometimes the ordering of the data that we define to describe this thing whatever it is that ordering may um, inadvertently define a difference that doesn't exist and so we have to somehow remove that too and so what we would like is a metric or a measurement of the difference between two objects, almost like a distance, um, that is the minimal such distance defined with respect to all of these possible variations, translation, rotation, inversion, and permutation. So graphically, we might have these two objects and you ask the question, if I apply a translation, rotation, permutation, or inversion to this object on the right, can I make it look close to this object on the left? And that closeness will be a numerical value that this metric obtains. Now, in this work, we didn't develop this uh, particular metric, but we relied heavily on this paper written by uh, the Wales group from Cambridge. Um, they used two techniques in that paper, one called go perm dist, which is a deterministic approach that will find definitely over time the optimal um, alignment of these two objects to minimize its distance. And then another technique called fast overlap, which is a kind of a heuristic approach, not deterministic, that uses um, something similar to what I think uh, the Curlin group has been using, effectively defines a distribution or a, a smooth uh, kernel correlation of these objects that it can uh, very quickly align. And then it uses something called the Hungarian algorithm or the shortest augmenting path algorithm to come up with the optimal permutation once these objects are aligned. So it turns out that breaking this problem into two um, halves, so first aligning as best you can, ignoring permutations, and then solving permutations, that's the key to doing uh, this solution efficiently. Whereas trying to do all of these at the same time is very inefficient or uh, 
sometimes unlikely to succeed because you'll get stuck in some local minimum in this object here. D, defined very generally, is not a smooth object. It can jump in its values depending on the permutation that you pick. So think of the first three objects here as smooth operations. Permutation is a discrete operation. So it's hard to get derivatives. And ultimately, uh, fast overlap is a technique that we decided to use. And this has a roughly n squared cost per pair of objects that have a size of n. OK, um, I can go back to talk about this, but it, since it's not my work, I'll move on and just say we were very fortunate that this work was done and we got to use it. Um, OK, so the next thing is uh, this n squared cost. So that's expensive. And if I have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these objects, each of size n, n is not the number of data, n is the size of the object. Uh, that's going to cost me a lot to figure out, you know, a massive distance matrix to see for all the objects which are more similar to others. And so maybe we need a faster approach. So if I ignore permutation for a second and just focus on translation and rotation, I can generate a so-called feature vector that describes this object reasonably quickly by taking the, what would be called the distance matrix or the pairwise distance matrix and flattening the upper right triangle of that object to make a vector that uniquely defines what this structure looks like. So that's, we'll call that um, a flattened atomic distance matrix, but it's just a feature vector that describes this object. And now I could send that feature vector into what we'll call clustering algorithms to try to see if there's inherent structure in that data. They so... My yes. ask if, if the distance matrix is flattened here row by row. Uh, if I didn't take the upper right triangle, you mean? Yeah, we, we take this triangle, but then um, how we form the long vector? Uh, is it row by row? Yeah, row by row, exactly. And now you're hitting on the point here again that permutations will be what makes that important, which way you do that. For the moment, I'm going to just ignore permutations and say, OK, in whatever order I was given the atoms, I will build in a standard way this distance matrix, just you know, loop over i and then over j. Um, in, and I, I won't think about the order of the data just yet. And then we'll get back to this problem of permutation a little bit later. But you're, you're anticipating the, the crux of the problem here. That's good. OK, so I'll focus on one particular clustering algorithm. There are many, and uh, you can read a lot about these online. Um, there are some really nice uh, read the docs online here. This is one about a method called hierarchical clustering. Um, HDB scan is the name of the algorithm. It's a density-based approach, which means it selectively picks points that are near one another that define a locally large density as belonging to the same cluster and points that are farther apart, depending on what metric you pick, that, that can be defined differently. Those objects are seen as sparse and therefore likely don't belong to the same cluster. And the example shown here is, is taken from this website, um, but it just shows how points might be associated with one another. And there's a very important aspect of this approach that is a challenge for most clustering algorithms, which is that they can do the density problem or they can do these linear chains well, but they can't do both at the same time sometimes. And HDB scan is particularly good at doing both. So you can describe this kind of uh, two objects here. Actually, these might even be different clusters depending on how you set up the algorithm, but these two are definitely more intuitively separate, let's say. And another nice output of HDB scan is that it gives you a score for each data point, uh, an associated probability that it belongs to that cluster. And those values are normalized between zero and one. And so you can say, yes, the deeper red color here, it's at the center approximately of this red cluster. So it's very likely that it belongs there. And in these green points, maybe again, these are the darker ones. For the blue, it's not so clear. These are more homogeneous, but maybe these and these are a bit more like they belong in that cluster. And we're going to use that information in our algorithm here. Um, one caveat, like all density-based approaches to clustering, um, this one suffers from the so-called curse of dimensionality. You'll see that written in many different places in data science, which just says that the more dimensions you have, you need more samples to collect information that's reliable on the density. So 
let's say if you've if you've done the work of collecting a thousand data points for two dimensional data, so that are let's say a hundred, <laughs> make it simple, because I can't do the square root of a thousand in my head. Uh, so ten by ten, right? If you add a new dimension, you'll have to collect at least ten times as much data to get similar densities, and it gets worse and worse and worse, and it goes up exponentially as you increase the number of, den of uh, dimensions. So that's a challenge, and to overcome that challenge, we use a dimensionality reduction algorithm, um, and in this case, it's called UMAP, or Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. Um, this is from the McInnes Group in Canada, and this is a really popular technique. You'll see lots of examples of this online. Again, the the code is available online. There's also fantastic documentation online if you want to learn about this and to try it out yourself. Um, and they give this very famous example of an elephant where the higher dimensional data is not very high dimensional, only 3D, but they color different parts of the elephant. And then they use this algorithm to squash that data down into two dimensions. And you can see that different parts of the element elephants are remain connected in this lower dimensional space. So the, the tusks here that were yellow remain connected together, tusks and trunk. Um, the dark red of the head remains as one cluster in this lower dimension representation. So the nice thing about this technique is it's fast and it, it definitely does preserve as best it can local and global structure. And you can also use it to maybe teach yourself or learn what is an appropriate metric that defines dist distances or differences in your data set. So it's it's quite a, a, a versatile technique to use. Okay, so this might be how it could work in our example. So let's say we had um, taken these flattened distance matrices, so removed translation and rotation from the problem. We still have permutations as an issue, but we'll get to that soon. We have these objects that look now like these feature vectors here, we use UMAP to look for differences, and we just use a Euclidean metric to define differences between these vectors, and then HDB scan to effectively color the clusters that emerge as kind of isolated objects. And that's what it might look like down here as you go from the n times n minus one over two um, distances to two dimensions, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so that, that can work. Now, what does it tell us? Well, so that was a cheap operation that we could do on all the data that we have. The next thing is that we use those probabilities that HDB scan provides us for each of these clusters to pick what we call exemplars or best examples from each cluster, those that have a high probability, and just a small number of them. And then we can use the more expensive method, this fast overlap method, to calculate the minimum distances between those objects. And now we can cluster those guys again, depending on their mutual similarity. So whether they are similar or not by this more accurate fast overlap technique that now takes into account permutations, okay? And so that distance matrix, sorry to use that term twice here, but this is the similarity when we include permutations between examples chosen from, let's say the centers of each of these clusters. That might look something like this and you would see, okay, uh, there are a lot of objects here that have very small distances. Maybe they are similar. And the ones that have larger distances, maybe they are different. It allows us to maybe think about constructing new clusters from that data. And ultimately, what we end up with is something we call an alignment basis for all of our data. So um, using the approach I just described, we can come up with a kind of um, an optimal set of representatives of the different alignments that the data can have. And then instead of comparing all to all, which was the original problem, we can just compare all our data with that smaller number of representatives. So we have cut down the dimensionality of the problem significantly, made it effectively a linear problem instead of a squared problem. And what that might look like is something similar to this here, where over tens of thousands of data points, we find that there's actually really only three behaviors that are dominant once we account for permutations. And two of them are very similar. They almost overlap. Okay, so now I'll talk much more about the details, but just that's the crux of the method. It's kind of complicated, but actually 
it makes a lot of intuitive sense. So you have some hard work to do to separate these objects. Instead of separating them all, you pick some best examples of their possible behavior and you compare those. And then using that optimal set, you then go back and compare all the data to the optimal set. So it's it's almost like you have defined a basis or within this space, a set of axes that you can compare against. And then you're effectively doing uh, projections onto those axes to figure out whether things are similar or not. Okay, so the now there is, the challenge here is picking the right number of such representatives and being sure that you span the data well. Um, but the nice thing about these clustering techniques is that let's say some new data comes along and you want to assess, okay, how well is that aligned with my existing representatives? If a technique like Yuma places that new data in this reduced dimensional space into some region of white space here that hasn't been encountered before, now you know you have something new because it is different from all the other objects. And therefore you can think to yourself, okay, maybe I need to augment this number of representations, this basis to come up with a better solution. And in that sense, it's kind of a self-consistent method. You can easily improve your description of all of the data as new data comes in. Okay, so that, that's a very brief description of the algorithm. If you want, we can pause here for a second and then we're about to talk about the application. But just to show you what it would look like, I've presented this cartoon before and the outcome would be that you get to color code each of these automatically to say, yes, everything that is the same color is similar, even though they were uh, all misaligned before. We can also color code them and align them to make them look very, very similar to the eye as well. Okay. So any questions at this point or... Um, David, are... very nice summary slide. Uh, if you show it again, overall algorithm. Yes. Uh, could, could you remind us again where where you can see the permutations in, in this process? Sure. So, okay. So the first step here, we do clustering. We establish, let's say, good examples of each cluster that emerges. There might be, I don't know, an order of 100 such clusters. And we pick those 100 examples. And there we do a minimization of this metric with respect to permutations as well. So let's say the best examples of each different class of behavior are somehow now distinguished with this metric. So let's say we have a system that has some permutation symmetry, like a triangle. So if you rotate the triangle or change the ordering of the elements of the triangle, it's still a triangle. Okay. So in that sense, you could easily imagine there would be three such clusters of data, depending on the order that you put in those three points, whether it was one, two, three, two, three, one, or three, two, one, right? So and three factorial six uh, for three atoms. Indeed, depending on how you define the, the feature vector, exactly. Mm -hmm. So now, if if you found that you had six different clusters, but when you picked examples from those clusters, that set was reduced to say, actually, no, there's only uh, one piece of information in here because they all collapse onto the same uh, distance. Then you know that, okay, that inherent um, symmetry is in your system. And when you make comparisons, you really only need to compare against one of those objects, not all six. Okay, so that, that already has reduced the size of the problem significantly for you. And then you could imagine all the possible symmetries that these objects might have in the approximate sense, because none of them are perfectly symmetric. And that allows you to define this kind of minimal basis that you can compare against with this full um, permutation invariant metric. So if I go back to this picture, every one of these n data points here is going to be compared in a permutation invariant sense to any one of these representatives along this axis here. Okay, is it clear? Yeah. Yes, thank you, David. Okay. Good. Okay, so I'm conscious of the time. So <clears throat> let me go quickly through an example here. Um, so in this case, 
this was the test system we were looking at. It was calcium ions embedded in solvent with borohydride anions around them. So they typically look like this. If you're a chemist, this would be the neutral object. Calcium has a charge of plus two, borohydride a charge of minus one. So you might expect these objects to exist as triples that are neutral or fully dissolved. Um, and then we were looking at these local minima here that were sampled in free energy as a function of distance from the interface for a fixed coordination number to see how rich is this data? Is it only just one object that's always in here or are there multiple such objects? So in this case, 50,000 frames. And I think there is only one calcium in each frame. So that's 50,000 sets of points with the number of uh, atoms on the order of about 20 to 30. Okay. So when you go through this full algorithm that we just described, you begin to see a picture that looks like this. Now, the axes here have no physical meaning. This is just how UMAP projected the data. And by the way, if I did this tomorrow, UMAP is a stochastic technique. You'll get a different picture every time. So it has some random elements within it. Um, so be careful if you ever apply this technique, you can control the random number generator and always get consistent results. But um, if you don't do that, it will always look different. Um, and we found on the order of eight groups, so it's Python, obviously it starts from zero here, but zero to seven, so eight groups, and then some noise that it could not cluster well, that's given the label minus one. So that's the black points here. Um, okay, but we can roughly divide these upon examination into different groups. So this very separate group over here on the left involves the calcium in green kind of embedded in here with two borohydrides that are kind of at right angles to one another approximately around that object. So this configuration over here. And then all the others, what they have in common is that the two borohydrides are on opposite sides, so at the north and the south pole of this kind of diagram here. And then what's different is the arrangement of the molecules around them. And this is pretty robust. If I examine everything within a cluster of the same color, they will effectively look like this. So you're seeing slightly different rotations of this flat solvent molecule, it's called THF, in how it arranges itself or packs itself around this object. And there are uh, seven of these different groups. You might say, well, why, why do you need to know this? It, it turns out it's important for chemistry because it might determine how well these objects are solvated, their energies. Also, if you do spectroscopy on these objects to learn about them, each of these different structures may have a different spectroscopic signal. And if you only model one of them, you'll have trouble matching the experiment. Other things you can do, so you can examine these different structures and, and pick other geometric uh, tests on these objects. So in this case, we were looking at some so-called dihedral angle between the carbon, oxygen, calcium, and boron. Like, how would you come up with this? Well, we just tried something. And what you'll see is that when you separate into these different groups, for the most part, uh, these different dihedral angles have well-defined, I would say, you know, unimodal distributions, single peaks, meaning they have one average value that is meaningful and a variance about that value and nothing else. There are some cases here where you maybe have two peaks, but they're very rare. Most of the time they are single peaks. And that's good because if you had to do the opposite problem, if you just came up with this metric as some way to distinguish these objects and you said, okay, show me what the distribution of dihedral angles looks like, I would say it would be quite difficult to go from this gray data down here to say that you have actually eight different groups. Maybe you could say, oh, one, two, three, maybe four, five, maybe six. That might be part of this peak. But it would be very challenging to separate this data, to deconvolute it into individual contributions. Whereas for free, if we go on the opposite way and do this clustering, we start to learn much more information, more, more deep knowledge about how this distribution is, is decomposed. Okay, something else. So uh, one of the coordinates that we had in our free energy, as we explained earlier, was distance from the interface. So you'll notice as we come closer, closer, closer to the interface, not much is changing. This is the distribution, meaning the population of each of these different clusters. So how many objects there are of the same cluster. 
represented by the size of this uh, segment of the pie chart. And not much is changing. There's maybe slight differences in the size of this red object here, but the color distribution is about the same until you get very close to the interface. At about five angstroms, it's completely different. And you see two new families that emerge as the dominant ones, this cyan color and this uh, purple color. And when you actually examine them, so we, we didn't know this in advance, but when you examine them, you see the key difference is that these objects have non-radial arrangements of the solvent molecules. This molecule here has a well-defined angle. It's not uh, radial as a function of distance from the calcium, like this molecule might be. It has kind of a, a kinked angle or a bent angle. And that's because when this object pushes against the interface, it doesn't give, it doesn't um, deform. And so instead, the coordination of this object has to deform. So just like you push something soft against a hard wall, it will uh, flatten itself if it was initially round. And so these two families, they look very similar, but the only difference is that this object has turned roughly 90 degrees. I couldn't ever have imagined that this would happen in such level of detail and then be able to come up with a mathematical test to test for it and then prove myself right or wrong. I mean, this this would be almost impossible, I think. But with this approach, we, we get that information for free. So I said that earlier, we don't want to, to bias our analysis of the data. We want the data to teach us its content. And this is exactly how that could work. It's really telling us, hey, there's this different behavior at interfaces, and here's what it looks like for the most part. So that, that's a, a real um, nice uh, outcome of this approach. Another thing you can do is you can train this UMAP approach to see these different clusters from data that you've already sampled, and then introduce new data and ask where it would lie in the same projection. And what we find is that this red data, it's kind of on the periphery of these darker regions. These are the, the old clusters we had defined before, and it starts to connect some of them. And if we pick one region here, so the green and the cyan, they come from the original data, one, two, three, and four. And the purple and the red are new clusters that come from this new region here, which is not in a free energy minimum. It's kind of midway between two free energies, which would imply it's a transition state of some kind, a mixing maybe of our uh, uh, tra transformation of one structure into another structure perhaps. And we can see that that's indeed the case. Uh, so this are typical examples of what the green and the cyan look like. And then when you examine this purple and red, it's essentially removing one object. This is getting more distant. This gap is bigger than it would be here similarly for this object. Otherwise, everything else looks very similar. And that's exactly what's happening in the free energy diagram. We are reducing the coordination number of the calcium from four, so one, two, three, four molecules, to three, and we're midway along that path. So this is the one of those objects, the fourth object leaving to leave behind three. So again, a nice way to... Um, reinforce your intuition perhaps about what could be happening or some way to inform your intuition if you didn't know what was happening and you were just controlling this randomly um, you might learn some interesting insight um okay I'll, I'll finish soon i know the time is running short but uh just to say we have started to look at more complicated systems so even dimers so two calciums bound together um, and trying to understand what their structure looks like. This is the standard free energy analysis that I described before, except this time we have two dimensions and a, a third dimension as well. Um, and we ask the question, okay, we see local minima. What did the structures look like? And this approach, even though this is a much more complicated system, it starts to allow us very quickly to develop statistics on what these objects look like. And now... The challenge is, it's, it's like you've converted a physics problem into more like a biology problem. Now you have to just come up with a taxonomy to name these objects and to give them unique labels so you can see them again um, because some of them have very peaked distributions. So we're, we're still working on this, but um, this work is under revision right now um, on the dimer problem. Okay, so maybe I can pause there uh, and summarize what we did. So.
what we have is essentially an analysis tool for very large data sets that combines various open source libraries. You can find these online. Um, and it allows us to categorize local atomic arrangements from microdynamics trajectories, or it could be any structural data you might have access to. It doesn't have to be molecular dynamics. And it allows us to identify interfacial species of ions and electrolytes, also species in the bulk, dimers, lots of different local structure. What's nice about the approach is that it has no previous assumption or bias on what we should expect. And it can be applied to you know, generally complex systems because of this neat aspect of allowing us to combine dimensionality reduction and hierarchical clustering together with a technique that allows us to remove uh, permutations as um, an issue that would normally differentiate the data, but instead allows us to make clear assumptions about what objects are similar and what are not. And with that, I'll thank you all for listening and thank my collaborators. Uh, Fabrice Roncaroni is a graduate student who worked on this. Anna and Sid are both postdocs who have since moved on to new positions. Um, and this work was funded by the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research and the Molecular Foundry at Berkeley Lab. So thank you. Thank you very much, David. Let us thank David for the nice presentation, please. So physically, <laughs> virtually. Thank you. Let me stop uh, the recording.